glutathione requires a whole host of other cofactors. And what we found in working with people in an experimental model of radiation burns, which uh, nobody wants, we found that we got Hello and welcome to the YouTube channel. I'm Dr. A, and on this channel we talk about all things integrative health, holistic healthcare, many, many other things around medicine. But today we want to jump into a question, combo of questions that came up. So I kind of put them all together. And it's what kind of uh, mistakes might somebody make taking or using glutathione? But you might wonder, well, you talk a lot about glutathione on the channel. Remind me what it does. Well, it's one of the core antioxidants in your body. So there are two core water-soluble antioxidants that work with one core fat-soluble antioxidant, and then all the other antioxidants are built around that. The two water-soluble are glutathione and vitamin C, and then vitamin E is in fat-soluble membranes. They all help each other out. They help each other recycle. Because glutathione can get used up in inflammatory conditions, other diseases, we might find ourselves in a place where we're recovering from something or we need extra, et cetera, and so we might find ways to supplement. So what are ways that that can maybe not go as well as we wanted it to? And of course, these are all individual, but these are just some ideas that came up through some questions that we got. So the first one is not remembering the three that we just talked about. And that, of course, is the synergy between vitamin C and glutathione and vitamin E, E like Edward. Now, vitamin C, we don't make in our body. Humans don't make it. Other animals do. So we have to get it in our diet or through supplements, uh, and it's water-soluble. So pretty much what comes in goes out within a 24-hour period with a little bit of storage in a couple of places. Vitamin E is fat-soluble. We tend to get that in food as well. And then glutathione is made by the human body from three amino acids being glutamine, cysteine, and glycine. So our liver primarily synthesizes this tripeptide glutathione. So we want to keep the family together. And so we always want to remember if we're going to be supporting glutathione, we want to make sure we're getting enough either dietary, supplemental, or some combo of the above of its helpers, vitamin C and vitamin E. We also want to remember that when we're sick and inflamed, which would be times we might need more glutathione, vitamin C and vitamin E might be taxed more as well. So that's the first thing is remember to keep the family together. Now, people will often comment, well, there's other antioxidants. There's ones that are stronger. Said it. True, all true. But your body is set up to operate with these three, vitamin C, vitamin E, and glutathione, as its base. And so after the base, then you can add on all the other antioxidants that you want. The next mistake might be using or taking the wrong form. Now, in the past, it was considered that oral glutathione didn't absorb very well. And if you just take glutathione uh, as an unchanged molecule, the tripeptide glutathione, like in a powder, that does not absorb orally if you eat it very well, a little bit absorb, but not too much. But in the last uh, few decades, we have developed delivery methods that increase glutathione absorption. And the two that have research for oral use are either acetyl glutathione, A-C-E-T-Y-L, acetyl glutathione, or liposomal glutathione. And there's some liposomal glutathiones that are actually acetyl glutathione in a liposomal form. Either of those will absorb, and they will absorb much, much better than a dry powder. So if you have, a, sometimes you get like a very inexpensive glutathione supplement, it will be not acetyl glutathione, not liposomal glutathione. It's just dry powder. You're not going to absorb very much of that. So that's that's one thing. The other is that sometimes people want a non-oral version, and there there's other ways to get it, but sometimes they'll go to a doctor who injects it into them, right? Now, this is not a mistake. It's often used when you get really uh, low or super inflamed or you have to heal after, you know, some uh, traumatic event or something. And your healthcare provider wants to increase the level in your body. And so in order to do that beyond what you can take orally, there are injectable forms. So glutathione can be injected depending on the type into the muscle. It can be injected subcutaneously and it can be injected intravenously. 
but you have to make sure that obviously it is an injectable form. The healthcare provider is getting it from a pharmacy that's licensed to make such things, and they're using it within the proper bounds of the type of uh, glutathione that it is. So, for example, sometimes there's a, another prescribed glutathione used in a nebulizer, you know, like you might use for your asthma or something. You can put glutathione in there. But some of the forms that are made sterile for injection are not appropriate in the nebulized form. So your healthcare provider has to make sure you're getting the right form for the right application. Now, a lot of people will say, well, why would I get it injected when I can take it orally? And the answer is you may not need to. But think of an injectable, a parenteral uh, application as, uh, say, filling the tank. You get really behind because you've got a lot of uh, stressors or you're healing, etc. This is a way to get your levels up and then the oral supplementation that you're doing uh, acetyl glutathione, liposomal, or, or uh, precursors, that will work better generally for you. So there's not a right or wrong answer. It's just get the right form for what you're trying to do. The third thing is really neglecting the cofactor. So for example, with vitamin C and vitamin E, they don't require a lot of cofactors to cycle between their oxidized and reduced forms. Glutathione uses a ton of cofactors and so where vitamin C just needs glutathione to work, for example, glutathione requires a whole host of other cofactors. And what we found in working with people uh, in an experimental model uh, of radiation burns, which uh, nobody wants, we found that we got better outcome by supporting the glutathione with its cofactors. So what are the cofactors for glutathione? Well, they include a, a number of B vitamins, primarily B2, B3, uh, and vitamin B5, actually, a lesser-known one. They include a number of minerals for cofactors. Magnesium is sort of a big macro one. Selenium and zinc are very involved. And then also vitamin C is supportive as well. So making sure you have your cofactors. Now, a lot of people will say, well, let's say I didn't just have surgery. I'm not recovering from it. I just want to kind of keep my glutathione cofactors going. Number one, diet. Make sure you have uh, all these trace elements, the minerals and vitamins and stuff in your uh, diet. Number two, if you're going to supplement them, a lot of people in their multivitamin, the B vitamins aren't that strong in a multivitamin, so they might take a B complex. That can be helpful. And then what I will usually do with patients is have them take a multi-mineral instead of just separate minerals if it's for maintenance. That way, it's just in one pill, you can get a multi-mineral that has a number of trace minerals, including zinc and selenium, and then it'll have some magnesium, et cetera. And of course, you should be getting this also from your diet. <clears throat> the next thing would be not having enough building blocks. So we said earlier that the liver can make glutathione. It's a tripeptide, so it has to put these three amino acids together. And if we supplement the uh, constituent amino acids or even pre-precursors, we'll talk about that, then that can help us to improve the liver's ability to create glutathione. Now, in some other uh, videos, we've talked about problems with the liver uh, and generally in the body having uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, some genetic issues in the formation of glutathione. For those people, precursors don't work quite as well. Um, but generally speaking, you would think of precursors either as primary, so that's the three constituents of the tripeptide. And so that's glutamine, cysteine, often found as N-acetylcysteine, NAC, uh, and then glycine, the amino acid. So you could take that. Now, there's uh, information, on, we've done a video on glynac, which is just glycine and N-acetylcysteine. And that's just two out of the three. And so that's a, another way that you can go. You can take them separate and take them together. It really doesn't matter there. And then there's sort of a pre-precursor, which is another sulfur-bearing molecule or a thiol. So uh, N-acetylcysteine, if you ever open a bottle of N-acetylcysteine, it might smell sulfury, like maybe eggs or something like that. It has uh, kind of a cousin in the thiol world called alpha-lipoic acid or thioctic acid, but usually it's alpha-lipoic acid in the supplement store. And alpha-lipoic acid is what we call pre-precursor. So it doesn't feed right in like N-acetylcysteine does, but it raises the thiol pool in the liver and the rest of the body, meaning the sulfur uh, constituent pool. 
And by alpha lipoic raising the thiol pool, it makes it easier for the body to make its own glutathione. So cysteine, glycine, glutamine, glynac, primary sort of uh, precursors, and then alpha lipoic acid as a secondary. And then the fifth thing that I see clinically with folks is just the sort of perspective, and that's not looking at it as a, this is a long-term process. So by that, we have kind of two primary meanings. One is if you've gotten sick or you're in recovery from a trauma, a surgery, a long-term illness, a long COVID or chronic illness or something, it may take a while to build your levels back up. So you want to remember the, the basics. You need vitamin E and vitamin C to go with your glutathione. You need the cofactor support being the B vitamins and the trace elements that we mentioned. And then you also want to remember whether you're going to direct support it with acetyl glutathione or liposomal, or you're going to indirect support it with glynac, NAC, cysteine glutamine separately, alpha lipoic acid, whatever you're going to do, it may take a while to get built back up. Then on the other end, what we mean about thinking long-term is because your body does make glutathione, long-term with people, often we don't need, because it's it's not inexpensive to supplement all those things. Long term, we see often with people, once they're recovered, they can get from their diet and maybe some supplements, their basic, the B complex of vitamins, the minerals, and uh, potentially take a precursor or take a low dose of uh, acetyl glutathione, liposomal glutathione. But they may only need the glutathione uh, that they're taking or a precursor a few days a week because they've got all the cofactors and they've rebuilt themselves. So a lot of it has to do with, are you acute or in you know some sort of acute need? Then you need to fill the tank faster. Are you in more of a chronic state where you've been supplementing a long time? Things are going pretty well. You're going to be just fine uh, doing cofactors and the support nutrients, and then maybe a little bit uh, of a precursor or a liposomal or acetyl glutathione. All right. I'm Dr. A. I'll see you all in the next video. I hope this answered all those questions. We'll talk later.